Pinocchio. Diplomacy isn't a weak option. But we all know that diplomacy without the credible threat of force invites contempt. However, diplomacy that sees military force as the first option rather than a last resort will result in war. Diplomacy done right, however, is the opposite of war. This week, we've witnessed a total collapse of diplomacy. <laughs> DC newsrooms won't say it, but American diplomats failed. President Biden told us that he was going to bring diplomacy back. Instead, it's on its back. We desperately need new, creative, visionary diplomacy, muscular diplomacy to secure meaningful peace when a conflict arises. Last summer, we watched helplessly as our credibility, our deterrence, and our national honor crumbled in the retreat from Afghanistan. Trump, President Trump and Biden both were dealing with the same country, the same enemy, and had the same diplomatic and military tools at hand. Both shared the ultimate goal of withdrawal. But the difference is that President Trump had an unapologetic, pro-American diplomacy with a credible military option behind him. It's clear that the Taliban respected and feared President Trump. He sought to withdraw on his terms, leaving a delicate but viable order behind, while reading the situation on the ground and adjusting his plans when necessary. Meanwhile, Joe Biden constantly radiated provocative weakness, announcing an arbitrary pullout date for a 9-11 anniversary photo op and squandering all his leverage. Then he pulled our military forces prematurely, exposing our embassy diplomats and American citizens to mortal danger. We watched as American troops were called back to Afghanistan, beginning Afghanistan because of Biden's poor planning. And we were horrified by the images of US troops trapped in a desperate mission to maintain a vulnerable security perimeter at the Kabul airport. This Obama third term crew left hundreds of US citizens behind. And what did they say when honest voices called them out? They bragged that they brought 90% home. Bringing 90% home means you left 10% behind. It was irresponsible, it was immoral, and it was un-American. <laughs> Americans don't leave Americans behind. Our allies and others feel the weakness coming from the White House. They watched in horror as less than one month into the Biden administration, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken revoked the terrorist designation for the Iranian allied Houthis in Yemen, only to see the Houthis launch drone and missile attacks on the UAE, a country that signed the Abraham Accords. Do you think our Middle East allies think America has strong diplomacy? And what do you think when they see the rewriting of borders in Europe? Again, is America dipl American diplomacy working? Let's be clear. Europe has seen its borders rewritten this week under Joe Biden and in 2014 when Barack Obama was president. And yet the left continues to mock the successful American first diplomatic strategy, even today. They think demanding NATO members pay their obligations is somehow undiplomatic. They think sanctioning Russia before an invasion in Europe is reckless. 
and they pretend that Donald Trump's unpredictability was harmful. Well, I saw firsthand that having a president putting the American people first and calling out the Germans for their hypocrisy and not telling our enemies what our strategy is, that made America and Europe safer. The American left also continues to push this phony narrative that President Trump's ambassadors were mean or rude. Well, if avoiding war could be accomplished by a dinner party, then we wouldn't be seeing Putin's forces inside Ukraine. <laughs> President Trump expected American ambassadors to represent Americans, not Europeans. And he expected us to stand up against European media outlets and the NGOs in Brussels, Berlin, and Paris. We don't want an America that leads. The Biden diplomats of Europe, who simply attended fancy dinners and receptions these past few months, failed to avoid war. Some of them even left Europe just as diplomacy with muscle was needed. They failed the American people. But do you think they will ever be held accountable for failing to find a peaceful solution? The answer is no. They will continue to mingle, exchange business cards, and send each other gifts. There will be no condemnation, no ridicule, or self-reflection from this diplomatic failure. Instead, the US media will continue to prop them up and celebrate their language skills and designer clothes. But the people will suffer. Certainly the people of Ukraine, but also the people of Europe, who now live in a region where the Russians have invaded. Where do we go from here? We have the example of President Trump and his America First diplomats, who were able to pull off a series of foreign policy miracles despite constant and fierce opposition from the bipartisan foreign policy establishment and self-described experts in Washington, D.C. <laughs> to dig ourselves out of this diplomatic hole, we must be honest about what went wrong. And we must commit to muscular diplomacy for the future, a deep, and systematic reform of our foreign policy institutions is needed to peacefully advance the interests of our nation. While official Washington is now dramatizing war everywhere, I want to focus on what went wrong in the lead up to this disaster, and specifically the diplomatic failure. It's time for the State Department to rediscover its mission and reclaim its purpose. Preventing war and working to keep the American people strong and prosperous is the goal. And we have a lot of work to do. We should start by making sure every Foreign Service officer and every employee understands and believes in this mission. I've worked at the State Department for 11 years. And I believe US diplomats should be on the ground resolving problems even while the military moves into place. It's vital now that we give our diplomats new tools and training in aggressive, preventative, and creative diplomacy. We need diplomats who are willing to push back without regard for the inevitable media attention or consequences. And we should protect them when they do it. Foreign Service officers must not be afraid to challenge the status quo. I know career diplomats at the State Department who want to use impactful diplomacy. They just have to be led by the right people. They need to be rewarded, not penalized, for taking creative risks. There's a growing sense that Biden and Blinken are removing our diplomats before they've had a chance to do their job and we should never hear again about non-essential workers at our embassies. Every worker on the payroll should be essential. 
Why in God's name are we employing people who aren't essential? <laughs> Every Foreign Service officer should be prepared, equipped, and ready to be sent to dangerous situations. It is called, after all, the Foreign Service. And we should equip them and empower them to do what they committed to do. Politicians from both political parties are trapped into a cycle of sending in weak negotiators who are quickly shoved aside to make room for U.S. troops. The State Department is viewed and used as if they simply schedule meetings, deliver stale and recycled speeches, and then go enjoy a good meal. We've asked our courageous military members to win hearts and minds when they should be brought in only after diplomatic negotiations have been completely exhausted. The State Department has what they call career cones. You can choose a public affairs cone, an economic cone, a management cone. And although State has a Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization, and USAID, USAID has a Crisis Stabilization and Governance Office, the time has come to have an official crisis cone as a career option at the State Department. This would give those Foreign Service officers who want to serve actively in crisis situations the support they need and deserve. Right now, we have political appointees at the State Department who are inept. There's no other way to say it. We have witnessed an appalling waste of diplomatic capital these past four weeks. As the Biden team hyped a bloody war, shifting U.S. troops around Europe, stoking paranoia in the West, destroying the Ukrainian economy, and utterly failing to deter Vladimir Putin. Think about this. Joe Biden promised unprecedented, unprecedented sanctions after a bloody Russian invasion. If you want to avoid war, you need to impose crippling sanctions before the war starts. He's done neither. The key to the Ukraine conflict and the symbolic core of the growing turmoil in Europe has always been energy, and specifically the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. It's a pipeline that will carry natural gas across the Baltic Sea from Russia to Germany. But what it really is, is a pipeline of influence. It is a pipeline that makes Germany and Europe dangerously dependent on Russia for its energy. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline is still not operational. It is still our most important, important leverage point over Putin. But sadly, the Biden diplomatic team refused to use it before the Russian invasion. Joe Biden and Democratic senators dropped the sanctions on Russia's pipeline creating the precise moment Putin saw American weakness. They also failed to leverage our existing alliances. One of the most cynical lies about America First foreign policy is that we squandered our relationship with NATO. By demanding NATO members pay their required 2% GDP on defense. I would argue that Donald Trump helped NATO by not ignoring its failures, limitations, and inequities. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've witnessed a Germany which wants to have a foreign policy like Switzerland. They want to sell cars to everyone and be an economic powerhouse with no geostrategic responsibilities. But that's not acceptable. Generations of Americans have sacrificed too much for Germany to drift away from the Western alliance. We must insist that they do more. If Germany and other NATO countries refuse to pay their NATO obligations, then they shouldn't be allowed to vote on items that affect the future of the alliance. 
I want to be clear, the opposite of America first is consensus with other countries. And we shouldn't be hell-bent on reaching consensus with countries who don't share the same threat assessment that we do. Berlin, Paris, and Brussels don't prioritize some of threats that we do. And that's okay. But U.S. policy must not be subordinate to European policy. Our goal cannot be consensus for the sake of unity. Consensus sounds great, but it's usually terrible for the United States. It usually means a watered-down statement or set of policies reflecting the lowest common denominator between countries. The left will tell you that we must be unified. I will tell you that we must have an effective policy. America First is not just withdrawing from optional wars and bringing our troops home. It's empowering our allies to do more in their own regions, in their own interests, so we can do less. Muscular diplomacy makes that happen. Sometimes we simply must insist. It's why President Trump wanted to bring more troops home from Germany and move existing troops to Poland. And it's why we wanted our troops out of Iraq and Afghanistan under our own timeline. It's why we brought all our troops home from Somalia and asked the Kenyans to police their own neighborhood. It's why we started discussions to bring the U.S. troops home from Kosovo when Kosovo and Serbia began to make economic normalization progress. Muscular diplomacy means using all of the tools of the United States government's economic might, including weaponizing America's abundant natural resources, and moving USAID back to the State Department, where it can better strengthen American diplomacy. Muscular diplomacy means tough, savvy, and sober diplomats who advocate tirelessly for our national interest. For decades, U.S. foreign policy has been based on unenforceable global accords. It's tried to force democracy on regions and countries who didn't want it and couldn't handle it. It has prized a nebulous war of ideas over pragmatic solutions to real problems. Most importantly, it has failed to define a clear understanding of the threats the United States has faced or the successful outcomes it could realistically achieve. Donald Trump was a temporary break from this failed style of diplomacy. We must not let the Biden administration drag us back into the unsuccessful policies of the past and unnecessary wars. This great nation deserves more. It deserves America first, and it deserves tough diplomats who can articulate why an America first policy is good for the world. When we speak clearly that America stands for peace, human rights, the rule of law, our allies will follow. In fact, they're hungrier than ever for these principles, and they're hungrier than